So welcome. This is the first quarter meeting for the Principal Advisory Council. Um, we're glad to have you here this morning. Dr. Glass is not able to be with us yet, but we will continue on through the agenda. And then when he is here, we'll I, we'll stop I, it. Oh, I'm you sorry, are. I'm, I am so sorry. I am yeah. Oh, thank you. I did not. You see, this is I it's it's difficult to see who all's on when I'm sharing my screen. Thank you so much for being here. Right, Appreciate yeah. that very much. Um, please, if you I will turn it right over to you then, Dr. Glass, and have you uh, welcome the group. Thanks so much and um, uh, great, great to connect with everybody. I wish that we could make these connections in person, but uh, like everything, we're doing the best we can. Uh, I was excited to hear about that this uh, this this group existed. Uh, there's a number of advisory panels or groups that the commissioner's office has. Uh, I think they're all really valuable just so I keep um, am able to keep a pulse of um, the 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 trends and challenges and things that are happening uh, in schools and across the state, uh, especially in a time right now uh, when there, there are so many challenges that I know you're managing at schools. Uh, I wonder if, if uh, as a starting off point, um, we could go through and just have folks um, identify them themselves. And so say your name and what school uh, you work at uh, and then uh, briefly what the structure of uh, schooling looks like in your building right now. Um, so I'll just uh, read off names and uh, to create some order to it and uh, just, okay. just would like a chance to meet all of you. So how about um, Bryn Jacobs? Good morning, Mr. Glass, Brian Jacobs. Uh, Brian. I know it's a weird spelling, so uh, thank my parents for that one. Uh, but uh, principal at Lafayette High School in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, I've been at this post, uh, it's the start of my ninth year, uh, and it's definitely been one like no other. So uh, it's a pleasure to meet you personally and uh, engage in this work. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Brian. Good to meet you as well. Uh, Michelle Curtis. Uh, I'm Michelle Ritchie Curtis. I'm the principal of Perry Central High School in Hazard, Kentucky. Um, currently, we are a hybrid school, but we went back to just online. Um, it has been a very interesting year. I was excited when the kids got here. Um, we were only here for a week, but um, it was good to get back to some normalcy. Sarah, thanks, Michelle. Uh, good, good to connect with you. And I have been to Perry Central High School back when it was a brand new building, and but that was a long time ago. But everyone still calls it the new school, and it's turning <laughs> <years> out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, good to good to connect with you. Uh, let's see. Looks like um, uh, Lester Diaz. Diaz. Yes, sir. Lester Diaz. I am the principal at Frederick Douglass High School here in Lexington, Kentucky, and uh, I, I like to steal all the really good ideas from Mr. Jacobs over at Lafayette, and not the bad ones, ju just the good ones. Um, we've, in Fayette County, we've started off our school year in all uh, virtual learning. What we've done as a district, as a group of high schools, is we, we've kind of, um, our A-B day schedule, we're all on the same page for the most part within our A-B day schedule. And then we have an all virtual day and within our A-B day schedule where the kids are, have all eight sections. We've got synchronous uh, time built in and asynchronous time built in. We've invested in Zoom. We use Canvas and we try to engage the students within that, that uh, synchronous time, giving new content, direct, direct instruction, and then use that asynchronous time for feedback uh, with our students. Yeah. Pleasure to be here, sir. Thank you, uh, Lester. Good, good to meet you. You really are in a new school. Oh, lost for now. Yes, yeah. yes, sir. For now. When did Frederick Douglass open? 2017, and uh, I think uh, Great Crossing has opened since then, and and I think now Scott County uh, High School is also getting a new building. So. It's keeping up with the Joneses. Right, right. Well, good, good to meet you. Uh, let's go to um, Shervita uh, West Jordan. I think you're on the screen as Dr. West. I am. How are you? I'm Shervita West, Principal Brandeis Elementary School, Jefferson County. 
Uh, currently, um, Jefferson County is um, doing NTI. So uh, we have that asynchronous a learning going on uh, with all of our schools uh, within the school district. Uh, but we are hoping that eventually at some point we will get to bring our kiddos uh, back to school as well. Thanks. Uh, good to meet you, Dr. West. Uh, let's go to um, Tamala Howard. And did I, did I pronounce your name correctly? Uh, almost Tamala Howard. Tamala, thank you. Yes, yes. Good morning. I am the, uh, I'm Tamala Howard. I am the principal at Uniontown Elementary School. I've been there 12 years and that's in Western Kentucky, um, close to Henderson, between Henderson and Paducah. But uh, anyway, we are operating on a hybrid schedule. We are in session. Uh, this week is fall break. We did take a fall break uh, because of just schedules and things with our parents. But we have students who come uh, two days a week, our blue schedule, two days a week, the white schedule. And then we have a day for NTI and cleaning of the building. And so far, we have been able to stay in school with that. Nice to meet you. Thanks, Tamla. Good to meet you, too. Um, Michael Kelly. I am uh, Mike Kelly, principal at uh, Valley High School here in Jefferson County. And uh, yeah, welcome aboard. And yeah, we are doing the NTI world and I think I'm like anybody in that world. So welcome. Uh, thanks, thanks, Mike. I, uh, I grew up in Meade County, so I know exactly where Valley is. Yeah, uh, let's see. Um, Melanie Irwin. Dr. Glass, Melanie's lost her voice, so um, she's been texting me, so she asked me to introduce herself. She's at Bath County High School, which is where I was the principal, and she was my assistant principal for 15 years, so she's been there five years since I went to KDE. Um, Bath County has been doing virtual learning um, so far, and they start a hybrid schedule on the 19th, on October 19th. Thanks, uh, thanks for um, that, Paul. Uh, good, good yeah. to you, and, and uh, thanks, Melanie. Glad that you're here. Uh, let's see, how about uh, Kim Rice? Good morning, Dr. Glass, and welcome to KDE. We're glad to have you here. I am Kim Rice. I'm the principal of the Academy at Shawnee, which is a 6 through 12 school in Jefferson County, Kentucky, in Jefferson County, rather. Uh, we are, like my colleague said before, in NTI 2.0. Hoping to return soon. We are pulling our hair out, trying to get our plans together so that we can return. We're just hoping that Jefferson County remains in a state where we can. So glad to have you at uh, KDE. Thank you so much. How about uh, Peggy Morris? Hi, good morning. Um, Dr. Glass, nice to meet you. I'm Peggy Sinclair Morris. I'm the principal at the Kentucky School for the Blind. Um, we're located right in the middle of Louisville in a, on beautiful Frankfurt Avenue. Um, we are currently virtu having virtual instruction, but bringing students that need more of a direct instruction to campus on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, we are hoping to have sort of a soft opening October 26. Again, bringing those kids in that are not making progress um, virtually and then hope to be able to open November 9th um, for all students. So it's really nice to meet you and it's great to have you here. Thank you, good to meet you. I, I did have a chance to review your, your opening plans. I think I have a visit scheduled later this month uh, to you come too. out of the school. Yeah, October 28th, we're looking forward to it. Great, thanks so much. Thank uh -huh. Let's see, Did I, uh, have I covered um, uh, all the principals who are on? Make sure I didn't miss anybody. I see uh, Byron Darnell has joined, he's always late. You know, he's been a slacker since uh, I first met him. So, uh, uh, Byron. Yeah, good morning. Pretty much true. Uh, <laughs> pretty much true. Uh, Byron Darnell, uh, I'm principal of Franklin Simpson High School in South Central Kentucky. And uh, we, I guess, following up on what others have said, uh, we have been virtual up to this point. Of course, uh, this week is our fall break. And uh, we plan to begin um, an A-B schedule starting on Monday. So pretty excited uh, to get students back in the building and see how that shows. But naturally, it's been uh, 
It's been pretty interesting to say the least, but uh, it's great to uh, be with everyone on this call. And uh, for those that don't know, uh, Byron and I have been uh, uh, friends for uh, our mo most of our lives. So we grew up together in Mead County. So I give him a hard time out of out of a place of love. Uh, and he's, he's a, a tremendous person and and great educator. So good to see you, Byron. Um, anybody else that I missed? Hello, I'm Jerry Rowland, and I'm representing Kentucky Tech. Um, I'm I've been at Monroe County Area Technology Center and. Just this week started as a regional consultant for the central region for ATCs. Um, our ATC serves Monroe County and Metcalf County, and both of those schools offer students uh, virtual, full-time virtual, or um, they can come in person full-time. And at the ATC, we've been working hard to serve students both ways. Thanks, Jerry. Good, good to meet you. And uh, Metcalf County is a place that uh, is close to my heart too. It's, I have lot, lots of family from uh, from that area and, and from Barron County too. Um, any any of the other uh, uh, folks that are on the advisory committee that um, didn't get a chance to speak, and maybe came on a little late. Okay, hearing none. I'd also like uh, just the KBE staff that's on. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, uh, please uh, unmute and introduce yourself and tell me a little bit about your role. All right, I will start. I am Jenny Ray and I'm the liaison for this group. Um, actually, P3, we, we tag team this quite a bit. That's the Principal Partnership Project or P3. And so Paul Prater is also with us um, this morning. And then uh, typically Stacy Noah is also a part of part of that team. So we're um, under uh, Rob Akers is our is our leadership. Um, for the Office of Educational Licensure and Effectiveness. Paul, I'll hand it to you next. All righty, Dr. Glass, I'm Paul Prater. I'm Principal Partnership Project under Rob in the Office of Educator Licensure and Effectiveness. And uh, this is my fifth year doing this. So I'd spent 15 years in Bath County as a high school principal uh, before this job. So I do this and then I also do superintendent evaluation for KDE. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, anyone else that's on that I haven't had a chance to meet yet? Yes, my name is Carrie McDaniel, and I am a professional learning coordinator in the Office of Teaching and Learning Division of Program Standards. Thanks, Carrie. And my name is Misty Higgins. I am Carrie's counterpart in as a professional learning coordinator in the Division of Program Standards. Thanks, Misty. Good to meet you. Um, I'm Eve Prophet. I work in the Office for Educator Licensure and Effectiveness under Rob Akers, and I work with preparation programs. And particularly for the past three years, been working with principal and administrator preparation programs. Thanks, hi Eve. Good morning, Dr. Glass. This is Todd Davis. I'm the director of the uh, Division of Educator Preparation and Certification in the Office of Educator Licensure and Effectiveness. I think we met uh, actually in one of the leadership meetings uh, a while back when you were calling in from your, your former role. So but it's good to be with you. Thanks, Todd. OK, have we had a chance to uh, connect with everyone? I know there's a few familiar names on here as well, um, but I just want to make sure that I've had a chance to to meet those that I, I haven't had a chance to connect with before. Just pause and see if um, anyone else. OK, sounds like uh, sounds like we got everybody. Well, thank you for the time and thanks for going through that. It's one of the things that I'm really focused on right now is just making connections like this. So spending the time to get to um, know people and, and see names and faces and, and build those relationships. It's really difficult in this era uh, to do that, but I think it's also really important, especially just for me uh, coming into the state, into this role. Um, I have a, a lot to learn and a lot of people uh, to meet, and the more sort of relationships and connections that I can make, uh, I think the more effective and better off uh, I'm going to be. I did grow up in Kentucky and am a third generation Kentucky educator. I, I grew up in, in Meade County, went to school at UK and started my teaching career in, in Hazard um, at Hazard High School. 
Uh, but I've been gone for uh, two decades, uh, working in Colorado and Ohio and Iowa and, and doing some consulting roles in other states. So uh, I have a lot to learn about uh, Kentucky and uh, to get caught back up on all the context here and what what uh, what are the priorities are right now. I can tell you that for me, uh, the priorities that, that I have just starting out, uh, the first one is uh, supporting schools and districts across the state and and managing their uh, educational response to COVID. Uh, that takes up an extraordinary amount of our time even now uh, after all the work that's been done this summer and the thinking um, that was put in place, all the preparation. Uh, it still it seems like um, I, I've talked about it. it seems like every decision that we make creates two more problems to have to figure out an answer to and I know that's uh, where everyone is uh, right now but I also know that it's starting to stabilize some uh, we've gone through sort of the um, uh, thinking about what the reopening models might look like and there's a variety of them that are out there from all NTI or remote learning experiences uh, to all in-person experiences with with layers of virus mitigation strategies in place and then hybrid models uh, that are in place to, uh, where we have kids home some part of the day or some part of the week and, and in person some part of the week and and there's really a continuum of what that looks like uh, across the state and it's uh, I don't know that any two models are exactly alike um, but I just think it reflects that people have come at this challenge in a lot of uh, different ways right now we don't know exactly what the best model is I, I think there are really trade-offs in every choice you make um, remaining in an all NTI or um, remote experience certainly from a, a public health standpoint is the safest option the virus is not going to get transmitted at least at school uh, in that format but it has other significant trade-offs uh, from a educational from a social emotional uh, from an economics uh, impact on the community as well and then certainly there are trade-offs and higher risks involved uh, if we have students that are that are in person uh, and and we can't meet all of the um, the best practices and expectations when it comes to um, uh, all, all of the layers of virus mitigation strategies uh, that, that need to be put in place. I think going forward with COVID, what we're going to see now is we have more and more schools that have come back and restarted. Some, some schools have been back and, and been open for a few weeks now. Uh, we're going to start to see the, the next problem we're going to have to think through is how we manage the, the outbreaks and the closures. Uh, and some of you are already going through that right now, uh, where you've got um, teachers that are uh, coming down with COVID, staff members that are coming down with COVID. Um, and hold on just a second. There we go. Uh, staff members that are coming down with COVID and uh, students that are coming down with COVID. Uh, it's you're seeing rising levels in the community and you're having to think through what do we do with that information? So that's a close conversation with uh, with your districts and with local public health uh, to find out what the right next step is. But I think that really that's the challenge that we're we're working through right now is uh, it's an, an element of uh, managing the disease. Uh, we're trying to have in person experiences which do increase the risk. Uh, and at, at the same time, we should expect that there are going to be cases that pop up and what do we do when one of those uh, occurs. So um, so that's a major pr a priority uh, right now. I know for you, it, it is for us at the department as well. Uh, other work that we've got going on, uh, looking at um, the state's response to uh, the events that happened this summer with Breonna uh, Taylor and George Floyd um, and work around anti-racism and equity. Um, what I'm doing right now is really trying to take stock of what's in place, what work is underway, and I don't want to disrupt any good good efforts that are underway. But I do think going forward, just based on uh, the needs that the state has and the direction that I've gotten from the State Board of Education, they really want to raise this up and make it a priority. So we have to go back and look at the capacity that we have in place and ask tough questions around, has that been effective? What else needs to be done? And how can we ultimately support practitioners in buildings uh, like, like you and the staff that you have in uh, creating real and meaningful changes uh, that ultimately impact students. So uh, that that's work that's ahead around anti-racism and equity work that's ongoing right now. Um, I I think a, a third major priority that I'm focused on this in this first year is how we manage uh, the economic impacts of COVID. Uh, we're seeing some 
drops in uh, available funding in this current budget year, you're likely not to feel that at a school level. We've been able to manage it at, the, at a state level and in, in programs that are inten intentionally we're making reductions in areas that don't have a disruptive impact on students to the greatest extent we can. There may be some things marginally, some grant programs that are, have less money available or that go away uh, through those reductions or cuts, uh, but we've really tried to prioritize making sure that we're not impacting direct services to students through those reductions and also take care of our people. Um, it's, it's really tough to think about someone losing their job in the middle of, of all of this and trying to find something else. So those have been our priorities. We tried to manage these in-year budget cuts is not impact direct services to students and not impact jobs. So we're working on that. I think we we have more work to do um, in seeing what the next budget year looks like when the legislature gets back together. What has been the full impact of uh, the economic downturn of COVID and collections and, and the funds that the state has? Uh, will we see support from the federal level to help bail out or support uh, schools and, and states? through this, there's a lot that we don't know, but that may be an, another challenge still on the horizon is just managing the economic impact that COVID has brought. So that's kind of the, um, the short term um, uh, immediate challenges that, that I'm focused on. Longer term, uh, uh, once we get through all of this, I, I really want us to get to a conversation in the state that's aspirational and ask what could school be and what could school be for Kentucky? Um, what is it that we, how do we need to uh, reimagine schools that in, in a way that really prepares for a future that's going to be more globally interconnected, more automated, even faster than what we have uh, right now uh, with the, the um, accelerations in things like access to data, uh, automation, uh, and the increasing globalization of, of the economy. How do we really prepare students for that world? And I, so I think that's a can be a scary conversation for some because it feels like it's going to be moving fast, but it's also an exciting conversation because I think it, it begs us to uh, think about how could learning improve? Uh, how can we create higher levels and, uh, and more meaningful levels of student uh, engagement and relevance uh, in our educational experiences for kids. So I look forward to getting to that uh, time with you. I have uh, just a few minutes uh, left with you, um, but so I wanted to just see if there were any any questions or feedback or comments that some of you might have. Uh, and, and I frame it like that questions or feedback or comments because you don't necessarily have to ask me something. It may be there may be some things that you think you just need to tell me and I want to take a few minutes and listen to that. So let me turn things back over uh, to um, uh, to you, uh, maybe to Jenny to uh, facilitate uh, if there's any responses that folks want to add. Sure, thank you so much and thank you so much for your insight and and for your leadership. So I will open it up to the group and you may just unmute or you can use the chat feature, whatever you're comfortable with um, to ask Dr. Glass any questions. I just want to say thank you for promising that 10% across the board raise. That's a great way to start <laughs> there. Great way to start. Thumbs up. You see, now all of you see what I've been dealing with for decades now, for decades, really. Like that guy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if we can't laugh, I don't know how we're going to make it through, I'll tell you. This is true. Hi, Dr. Glass. This is Peggy from KSB. I just wanted to say um, I'm a New Mexico native, northern New Mexico, and my mother was born and raised in Fort Collins. So um, great part of the country, but glad you're back here in Kentucky. So yeah, thank you. That's that's an amazing. It's a beautiful part of the country. Um, we were there um, last spring. We we were in uh, Santa Fe for a few days and then spent uh, a few days driving through northern New Mexico and southern Colorado. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous area. Dr. Glass, this is Rob. Uh, I want to shamelessly praise my P3 team. Uh, they run a couple of our advisors, but they also do all the certified evaluation training initially. Uh, the amount of pivoting and work that they have done, and I have um, I'm surprised they, they won't cuss me in front of you, but I have added more to their plates over the past several months and they have answered 
all like nobody's business and they serve with a true principal servant heart and uh they're one of the the gems of kde and just wanted to make sure that they get they got to hear me tell you that in, in front of them thanks for saying that rob i look forward to working with all of you um more as time goes on thank you rob thanks rob all right, anyone else have any comments or questions for Dr. Glass this morning? We encourage you to respond. Okay, well, hearing none, um, I, I do look forward to spending more time with you uh, going forward. I'm actually triple booked this morning, uh, so I was happy to get you know shove some other things out of the way to get to make this connection again i really think these advisory groups are are so important and there was a lot of foresight in previous commissioners that have created these uh these groups but i, I look forward to developing relationships with, with all of you learning uh with and from all of you and and doing important work ahead um i, I will put a plug in for we sent out a um a, a survey statewide earlier this week um, with three simple questions. Uh, what are the things that we should keep doing in Kentucky? And these are things that you're proud of uh, that are that are it's it's the right work and that we need to hang on to. Uh, so think about what is, what is that those things that we should keep doing and put that in. Uh, what are the things that we should stop doing? And these are things that are not of value or perhaps once were of value, but uh, their value has left or their distractions or their uh, they detract from the important work. So what are the things that we should stop doing? And then what are the things that we should start doing? which is gets us starts to move us toward that aspirational conversation um, looking toward the future um, thanks uh, Karen I see she popped in the survey link uh, so please take the time to do that please share it also with your staff members with your community with your students uh, we really want to gather broad perspective um, on on how people are thinking about uh, sort of the current state in Kentucky but also thinking ahead to what the future could look like. Uh, look forward to connecting with all of you more and thanks for the time this morning. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, if you would um, also we'll, we'll have a reminder about that survey um, at the end of our meeting today just to remind you to to take that survey as well as to share it with others. So at this time, if you would please take a look at the fourth quarter um, summary minutes from our July 22nd meeting. They were included in the calendar invitation and then also Paul Paul might have already dropped them in the chat a link to it to them in the chat. And then once you've had a had a moment to review those. If I just need a motion to accept if you would unmute and announce your name. And motion. Lester Diaz, motion to accept. Thank you, Lester. Do we have a second? Yeah, I'm right. Michelle Reed, for a second. We have a couple of seconds. Thank you. And all in favor, if you would please just type approve in the chat feature and then your name will be attached to that. And that's how we'll make sure that we do have consensus. Thank you for doing that. All right, we've already, Dr. Glass um, helped us with a roll call this morning, but for the record, as we as we typically do, if you would please also use the check-in, uh, the digital sign-in, um, and I believe Paul will will put that in the chat as well, and you can do that at any point during the meeting or even after after the meeting. We do have the record from the recording that you were here, but that's just another way that we do um, ensure your attendance. So while you're while you're taking care of that, I would like to introduce Todd Davis. Um, and I believe he and uh, Rob Akers are going to be tag teaming this agenda item about the request to waive section 2 2G of 704KR 3 colon 370 of that is work for personnel of personnel evaluation. So Todd, I will turn it over to you. I believe I do have your no, I don't have yours. Yes, I do. Yeah, have your slides. You're, you're ready to go. 
Thanks, Jenny. Uh, appreciate that. Hello, everyone. Uh, and actually, I'm going to turn it over to Rob and let him let him start. He's the one that actually presented to the board yesterday. So. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to be with you. Hope you all are doing well in your individual schools and that you're navigating this crazy time as well as you can. Uh, probably no role tougher than being a, a school principal and I know you never take the credit for all the good things that go well in your school and you always take the credit for all the bad things and protect your people so uh, just know we appreciate you and, and uh, keenly aware of what you're going through as and in response to that one of the um, additional pieces of the flexibility we thought was important was to provide a little more wiggle room around uh, personnel evaluation. Um, now, part of the certified evaluation exists in statute, which we can't touch. That's a general assembly thing, but some of it is, exists in regulation. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, 704 KAR 3370. And the critical part that the board waived yesterday in their recognition of the need for flexibility was in moving the 30 day timeline from when you have to inform your staffs about the the requirements for the current year CEP whether it's been because you haven't seen them in person yet or uh, you've had maybe some last minute hires or you've had um, a variety of in person and virtual or you know any other uh, consideration that that has yet to kind of reveal itself we felt like it was important to provide that flexibility with that, uh, local boards have the ability to make a lot of changes to the CEPs during the course of the year. I'm sure you remember last year, Senate Bill 174 uh, or 77. Was it 77, Todd? Yes, 177. Thanks. 174 was a, another one in our office. But 177 <laughs> basically um, allowed districts to to just kind of punt evaluation right in the throes of the early days of the pandemic. Uh, and that was, like we said, that was a general assembly action. And who knows, they may take action on this in session, but since they're not in session, we wanted to make sure that local districts had the authority and the flexibility to be able to, to change a few things. What hasn't um, and this, we got this from all of our stakeholder groups, whether it's superintendents or co-ops, um, the education continuation task force, everybody felt like there needed to be some sort of an evaluation as long as we were ha having school one way, shape or another. They did ask for some flexibility around it, and that's where the local boards need to take a peek at their CEs and see are the, uh, the sources of evidence going to be sufficient. In statute, it says that if you are a tenured teacher, and it's your it's your summative year. You're still going to have to evaluate them. Same thing's true for non-tenured teachers, but that could allow some flexibility if your district that evaluates every teacher every year to be able to hold off on those folks who are not in year three of that summative cycle if they're a tenured teacher to create a little extra breathing room for you there. So with that, um, hopefully your boards will take a good look at your CEPs and collaborate with you or your 50-50 committees to see what changes need to be made uh, and what can happen here in the interim and hoping that we get back to a more regular schedule but in the um, with the possibility that things are going to be stop and start and hybrid and intermittent for the foreseeable future that that level of flexibility we think is is something that districts are going to need. Todd, what would you like to add to that? Uh, the only thing, and I, th I think you mentioned this, but um, I just want to make sure that that everyone knows that any changes, so the, there still needs to be multiple sources of evidence. Uh, we're still using the framework and PCEL for, uh, for principal evaluation and so forth, but uh, any changes to the timelines, um, frequency, uh, you know, the number of observations, different things like that. And if you want to spread them out over the summative cycle, then uh, that only requires board approval now at your local uh, local board. So there's no submission to KDE required uh, to reflect these changes. So completely local decision and local control as, as far as that goes. Other than that, there's unless there's some questions um, that people might have. 
around the flexibility. Yes, definitely want to open that up to the group. You might also notice the guiding question. It says due to the various plans for restarting school, what challenges do principals um, or what challenges do you feel um, related to certified evaluation requirements? So you may unmute your mic or use the chat feature. Any comments or questions for Rob or Todd? Okay. The only thing I can think of is that at Perry Central, we've had teachers submitting the videos that they're sending out to the students in their Google Classroom. And as we watch those, we've found it's really hard to evaluate that, I guess because we're so used to being in person in the class. So it's really hard to collect the same kind of evidence that I would if I was in person. So, and, and I think that's a, a common, probably a common con concern across the, the, the state as we move forward. Um, obviously things are gonna look different. Uh, so that kind of leads into to where I wanted to go anyway, is that the, the P3 team is offering, and I'll let Jenny speak to, to the details here in a minute, but we're offering a, uh, some learning sessions of what the f so at least some specific um, components of the framework might look like through the lens of virtual and uh, digital instruction. So uh, it, it will be a great resource uh, that Danielson has provided and uh, we're working through some logistics of how we can provide that across the state, but um, it's free on Danielson's website and um, you just have to register, but uh, we're, we're trying to get it set up to where we can provide it. So hopefully that'll work out. But Jenny, you want to speak to the to the deeper details on that? Sure. So just kind of in commenting, Michelle, with what you're talking about, saying it's difficult to to recognize evidence of effective teaching in a, in a digital platform is is what I heard you at talking about and one of the things that the Danielson group has created is they've narrowed their focus on specific components of the framework and they've they have provided some additional language around what that might look like digitally speaking it not only talks about what it might look like but offers some um, ideas about where to start where to begin and on November 5th we're going to have two options for school leaders to connect together and with us we're going to just be facilitating some learning around the resource as well as just providing a time and space for leaders to share what they're doing that connects to what what the Danielson group has already proposed that's on November 5th and we'll offer that at t from 10 to 11 Eastern time as well as from 1 to 2 Eastern time. More information will come. This is we're just in the very uh, beginning development st stages of what that training um, and really a connecting time, connecting learning will look like. More in, more info to come. All right, thank you, Todd and Rob. Are there any other additional comments or questions on this topic? OK, hearing none, we will move to the next sec section. Thank you so much, Rob and Todd, for joining us this morning. So our next section is feedback on instructional resources um, for teachers and we have Misty Higgins and Carrie McDaniel with us and um, I will just turn it over to you to share your screen. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Carrie McDaniel and I am joined today by Misty Higgins. We are professional learning coordinators in the Office of Teaching and Learning and the Division of Program Standards. Today we'd like to update you on some of the standards resources available to you on kystandards.org and we will be exploring resources that will support you as you implement the CAS. So today we'll give you an opportunity to really give us feedback on these resources as well. 
As you may already be aware, the Office of Teaching and Learning has developed a three year implementation plan to carry this work out. We are currently in year two of the three year plan. So last year there was a focus on systems and structures to support standards implementation. This year there's really a focus on that balanced assessment piece. So this is really just taking a deeper dive into formative assessment. And then next year we will be shifting to instructional best practice. Now we know that gets woven into all that we do. However, we will be taking a very intentional look at this work, both from a general as well as a content specific lens. And so here's a snapshot of the kystandards.org website. This is really your one stop shop to all of the resources available to you. You'll notice you have two options you can select here, explore the standards and your standards resources. When you click on explore your standards, you will be taken to all of the standards for each content area. But in the top left corner, you'll notice that gray circle there with the plus sign. By clicking this plus sign, you'll be able to subscribe to the standards newsletter and stay updated with new resources as they're released. So today we're really just focusing, if we look at those two tabs on that second option, your standards resources. Once you click on that standard resources tab, this is what you're going to see. Everything's broken down into general resources and content area resources. So while there's a lot of information contained inside each one of these icons, we wanted to take a few minutes to highlight the ones we feel are most important in supporting standards implementation from an administrator's perspective. So while there are a plethora of resources available to you on kystandards.org, we wanted to feel, share what we feel is most important in your work in helping to implement the standards with teachers. So last year's modules on getting to know the CAS modules were created to build a shared understanding of the architecture organizational structure of the documents, how and why the standards were implemented um, or why they were revised, as well as how the CAS support teachers and stakeholders in their implementation of the standards. So the getting to know the CAS modules were created for all content areas, reading and writing, math, science, social studies, health and PE, and career studies and financial literacy. The breaking down of standard protocols were created to provide schools and districts with a structure or process for really dissecting that stand, the standards to get at the heart of what the standards are really asking students to know and be able to do, and to assist teachers in having that deeper understanding as to the depth of learning really intended with each individual standard. The assignment review protocols are there to support teachers in ensuring that the assignments they are creating are aligned to their grade level standards. It provides a structure for teachers and leaders to determine does this task give students the opportunity to meaningfully engage in worthwhile grade level content and teachers are able to use the protocol to identify if assignments are they are using are weakly aligned partially aligned or strongly aligned. The student assignment libraries provide assignments and rating rationales at each grade level in reading and writing mathematics and social studies to help educators practice identifying tasks that are strongly, partially, and weakly aligned to standards. The assignments can be used with the assignment review protocol that's included to develop a better understanding of the tool and how it can be applied to a teacher's own work. So we are in the process right now of revising the model curriculum framework. Last spring, we released the first section on a curriculum development process that's providing the possible process that schools and districts can use as they work to really translate the standards into a local guaranteed and viable curriculum. Along with the process itself, it also includes an appendix that is a toolkit of resources to help school and district leaders really work through the process. And so here's where you will go to access the model curriculum framework. And we also have an asynchronous professional learning module that helps to build your understanding of the model curriculum framework. And so here's where you'll go to access that module. 
So now let's take a closer look at the resources available to you, um, av available to us this year in year two of our three year implementation cycle. The first ones that we wanted to start with is the implementation guidance documents. Um, these are really available to help assist school and district leaders in identifying what are the resources that we have available from KDE to support the different stages of standards implementation. You know, we recognize that across the state, every school and district is in a different place in terms of implementing the standards, and we fully recognize that COVID has impacted that work across the state. So we wanted to think about how could we create a document that was like a one stop for whatever stage you might be in of here are the resources to support that and that's where these guidance documents came from we have them available for reading writing mathematics social studies also, the newest one we have is a general implementation guidance document, and that one is specifically designed more for school and district leaders. We do update those as new resources are created and released so that you have the most up to date information as you look at those documents. This is just a screenshot from the general implementation guidance. And again, they all have a very similar format to them. So you will see that in a box there are questions and it's like if you're asking this question, if this is the stage you are in, what resources or tools are available to support the work? So on this one, you'll see that first question is, so what resources are available to help align our local curriculum to the Kentucky academic standards. So for each question underneath are the resources that would support answering the question. All the resources are hyperlinked so that you can access them quickly. And then it also includes a brief description of what is the purpose of that particular resource. On our content specific ones, one thing I will let you know, occasionally you will see where we put in a recommended order for using certain resources because when they were designed, that was kind of the purpose. They were designed to go a little bit deeper over time. So just know that I think math is a good one where you might see that it'll say, if you're answering this question or working in this spot, then we recommend using the resources in this particular order. But again, they're just your one stop for when you're coming back to that standard work, where are we and what do we have available from KDE to support us? To access all of the implementation guidance documents, simply under general resources, click on the very first icon and it's going to take you to a page with all of those documents. The second resource from this year we wanted to make sure that you were aware of is our fall 2020 professional learning series. As Carrie mentioned earlier, we're in year two of our three year plan looking at balance assessment. Really what we're doing is following backwards design. If last year was really about getting to know the standards, figuring out what are these standards asking students to know and be able to do, this year is beginning to look at, well, how are we going to know if they've learned it? So the purpose of the fall series is to really help educators in identifying the purposes of different types of assessment. In every school and district across the state, we're all giving a variety of different kinds of assessments. So it's just making sure that we know what's the purpose of each assessment and are we using the evidence that each elicits in the way that it was actually intended to be used. Also with this series, we're helping to build an understanding of the assessment cycle. So really beginning to understand that small granular size at the classroom level with classroom formative as well di or diagnostic up to looking at that district interim and the state assessment. So how does that form one complete picture of an assessment cycle and how do those different pieces work together? And then most importantly within all of this, we're really digging into how do we elicit evidence of student learning that is making sure that they are meeting the grade level expectations of the standards in each content area. So to, to support understanding around this, we are releasing four asynchronous modules, one each month. The first one was released last September or this past September, so it is already available on KY standards. So on the table in that first column, you're going to see the date when we will release this, uh, the module and make it available on KY standards. The second column is just the topic of the module and then that last column is a description. 
you're going to notice that the first module, the whole purpose was just a big broad picture of what do we mean by a comprehensive balanced system of assessment. But starting this month, the one that we will release next Wednesday, we're really taking that deep dive into formative assessment because we know when we look at the research, when classroom formative assessment is used intentionally and purposefully, that it can significantly impact student achievement. So the next module is beginning to develop that understanding of what formative assessment is and what do we mean by formative assessment being a process. The remaining two modules, they are looking at different elements of the formative assessment process. And just know that as we're building these modules, we are keeping in mind. So how does this look in terms of distance learning and how does this look in the face to face setting? So there are general elements of formative assessment that apply across the board, but it's looking at how do we make sure we're doing regardless of the setting we're setting in with some unique considerations for distance learning and unique considerations for that face to face. Each video is going to be a com or I'm sorry, each module will be accompanied by a video that's just going to provide you a quick overview of what's the content contained within the module, as well as the resources that are available in it to help support understanding. Um, we are creating these modules in partnership with WestEd, and they are a national research organization that we have been incredibly impressed with, just the knowledge and the expertise they bring to the table. But we are working closely alongside them to make sure that that knowledge and expertise is specific to our context here in Kentucky. So again, I'll show you in a second where you can find more information about them. To access the modules as we release them, simply go to general resources and click on professional learning modules and it'll take you to each of those as they become available. And then the last one we wanted to share, and this is something we are incredibly excited about, we've already really enjoyed being a part of, is the distance learning playbook study. Um, each semester, we try to pick a book or a topic that's very timely and relevant to educators across Kentucky. And I don't know what could be more relevant right now than this idea of trying to figure out distance learning. I feel like if the teachers across the state feel like I do, we're all back at the bottom of the learning curve. We all probably feel like brand new teachers right now as we're trying to figure out how to best meet the student needs in the distance learning setting. So in late summer, Doug Fisher, Nancy Fry, and John Hattie released a book that was called the Distance Learning Playbook, and we immediately felt like it was going to be a good fit, and this study has been well received. We have over 550 educators across the state that are actively participating in this study. And the purpose of it is really just to identify and utilize evidence based strategies in the virtual setting. So we know some of those elements of teaching and learning that are going to significantly impact student achievement. But the challenge right now is, well, how do we apply that to the distance learning setting? And that's what this text really sets out to help us do. And as part of the study, we really want to give educators an opportunity to reflect on their own current practice and figure out how they can apply what they're learning from this text in a way that impacts whatever their role might be. And finally, we really want to make sure we're giving educators a chance to collaborate with colleagues across the state. It's kind of that saying of we're all in this together right now. And so it's important for educators to have conversations across the state of what are they doing? What's working well? How can we all work together to improve this for our students? And so we make sure we have those opportunities, whether it's through the synchronous meeting we have each month, as well as the interactions that they have within the Google Classroom community. Um, I'm going to where you can find more information on the study, but it, even though it started in September, it is self paced, so you are still completely welcome to join us in this study if you would like. And as leaders, one thing I want you to know, when we finish a study, so we'll finish this one up in December, we always package it along with all of the resources that we utilized and we release that so that anyone could pick up that plan and facilitate the study back in their own school or district. So we're trying to give you everything that you would need to be able to lead that in your own district. Um, if you want to register for the book study or find out more information about it, simply under general resources, click on professional learning opportunities. And then finally, two things that are coming soon. Um, Carrie talked about the model curriculum framework and how we're in the process of revising that right now. And that first section was looking at big picture of how what is the possible process to really take the standards and help align 
curriculum to those standards. The next section we're releasing later this year is on PLCs. So how do we bridge the gap between this written local curriculum that we have and actually what gets implemented at the classroom level and how PLCs can help support that? And then again, we're also later this year going to release the balanced um, assessment section, and that will very much mirror the work we're doing in those modules that we are releasing. So I know that's a lot of information, um, and that's just the sample of some of the resources, but those are the ones we felt could be important to you and your role as principals. And so now I'm going to turn it back over to Carrie because we would like to get some feedback from you. Thank you, Misty. So now we'd like to gather feedback from those of you that are really in the trenches in schools with students every day and find out what resources from kystandards.org have been most helpful to you in your school or district. So using or by unmuting, we'd love to hear from you now as to which resources have been most helpful. We see several people who are interested in the text, so thank you to Paul for posting a link to order that in the chat. Oh, and Carrie, let me just say quickly too. one of the great things, and if for some reason you're not able to join the study, if you just email me or Carrie, I'll let, I'll send it to you. But um, we reached out to Doug Fisher, who is one of the co-authors on that text, and he graciously volunteered his time to um, lead our opening session that we had back in September. It's about a 45 minute session. We recorded that and we did we have it in our resources in the Google Classroom, but if for any reason you would like to see that. Um, if you just email us, we can send you a link to watch that video. Absolutely, Misty, that's a great point. I know the participants got a lot out of that session with with Dr. Fisher. OK, since we don't have any feedback at the moment for the resources that have been helpful to you. We're going to move on to our second question. If you think of something in regards to the first question, feel free to enter that in the chat. As we go, we can always go back to that. So now we'd like you to think about what topics and or resources may still be needed to support standards implementation back in your school or district. So just like on the previous question, feel free to unmute um, or share in the chat. What are those resources you really feel are still needed? Hi, this is Darla Pang from Boone County Schools, Ackerman Middle School. Uh, I know my teachers um, struggle with um, collaborative work. Our curriculum before allowed them to do a lot of collaborative work, but with some of the COVID guidelines, they're struggling with engaging the students without having them near or touching each other or sharing materials. So really looking at kind of those engagement collaboration um, strategies that can help in the, the virtual setting, correct? Well, we actually have a hybrid setting. So the students are here in the building, but they're separated six feet apart in the classrooms. So they can't really put them in groups to do the collaborative work that they've done it in the past. So yeah, I guess it would be the same strategies you would use for virtual because even though they're here, they're not allowed to collaborate and get near each other. So virtual and in keeping in mind physical distancing in the classroom. Correct. Thank you for sharing that. We've I've made a note of that too. Um, we're going to use a lot of this feedback today um, to think about what has worked well and what is needed and use it to assist us in planning future professional learning opportunities. So thank you for sharing. This right. is uh, this is Go Byron ahead. here. Um, <laughs> I've been in enough of these to know radio silence is just tough. So um, <laughs> we get we got to jump in. Um, you know, I, 
at least the the predicament now well there are many predicaments but you know given the nature of uh putting safety first health first you know we've really uh, just are are going away from all of the emphasis that we've truly been emphasizing which is that collaborative environment that especially that um peer-to-peer and now we're in a situation that uh is really constricted albeit can be done uh electronically um but, but you know it's just it, it's just such a barrier and you know probably also moving back toward a need for more direct instruction which you know isn't always a bad thing but you know when it's the predominant model of course it's not ideal so you know we're just really in a time that um you know we're really swimming back upstream uh after putting all this emphasis in moving away from kind of that that traditional model of uh teacher in the front mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's where it's that balance between um, synchronous and asynchronous and what's the best use of each of those options um, when we're with students. And I think, like I said earlier, we're all at the bottom of a learning curve again, trying to figure this out together. But I will tell you, there are a lot of great resources out there to help with it. But the text that we mentioned that we're doing the book study on, it does have a great module in there um, on that whole collaboration and how do we do that well in distance learning. OK, thank you so much and we can con continue to to uh, get your comments and your questions and using the chat feature. So please feel free to do that or there will also be some time at the end if you just have some questions and we'll capture those to share with the group as well and with the leadership team. All right, thank you all so much. Um, thank you to thank both you. of you for presenting. Thank you. And at this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Connie White, and she is going to provide some COVID-19 updates um, with, the, with the Kentucky Department for Public Health and around school re-entry metrics. So Dr. White. I am I here. Will, yes, thank you. I will turn it over to you. Great. Right. Well, I am going to share my screen. At least that is the plan today. Um, and can you see that? Well, that's not what I want to share. Never mind. Let's try that again. I'm sharing the wrong thing. That's what I'm trying to share right there. We go. OK, so let's see if I can even get it better than that. All right, so thank you very much for having me today. Uh, I feel like I am um, a stepsister of the Department of Education. I've been on so many different calls and I appreciate y'all having me before and, and asking me to come back. Um, I just wanted to give you an update of where we are now. Uh, I, at first, I want to say how pleased I was to hear uh, the commissioner talking about the uh, spotlight you're going to have on uh, equity. Uh, in the Department of Education. It is certainly a an area uh, of a tremendous interest in the Department for Public Health, and I think I see some synergy that we can uh, provide along with the Department of Education, and I, and I hope as we're getting co uh, complementing each other on the COVID uh, pandemic, we will find ways to complement each other as we work on equity. Um, I also wanted to comment about, uh, well, before I say that, I am on the Kentucky Board of Education. Uh, WISC committee, the whole school, whole community, whole child subcommittee. Uh, and I think that there'll be a lot of work going on in that committee as well. And so that's a nice group that has not only public health, but it has behavioral health, a couple of folks from our cabinet, um, as well as education folks. And so I think that's going to be a great way for us to work together. Uh, as the uh, commissioner said, um, we are starting to stabilize in some aspects. Uh, we are stabilizing our plans and we're stabilizing our understanding of this virus. Uh, but what is not stabilizing um, is uh, the caseload. Uh, I've showed you, I think the governor calls this the purple chart, uh, but this uh, chart here, and I don't know if you've seen it, I apologize for having to explain it again, but I'm, I don't think that everyone has seen this. Each one of these purple bars is the number of cases 
during a week, and this is starting with March the 2nd to the 8th, when we had our first cases of COVID-19, and each bar is a different week. So, of course, at the beginning, we skyrocketed up in an, almost an exponential growth rate, going from 500 to 1,000 in a week. But after that, this is when we were um, uh, healthy at home, and our caseload was around a little over 1,000. Almost 1,500 here, 1,900, 1,500 here. Um, but we, we cruised along here, and on this date, uh, this is the week that we really a healthy at home document. So if you can kind of take your hand and put it over this part of the, of the graph, this is what we were seeing. We went from zero to 1,000 to 1,500. Then we released healthy uh, at school. Then we had the 4th of July and everything cut loose. We went from 1,500 to 1,700 to 2,400 to 3,700. I have to tell you, these three weeks were probably the scariest weeks in my entire public health career because everything was telling us that the next week what we were going to see was going to be 7,000 and the next week would be 14,000. That's what had happened in all the other southern states. This is when Florida in New Mexico, I'm mean, sorry, Arizona, Texas were just taking off and we could foresee that happening in Kentucky, which was, was terrifying. So right in this week here, this is the week of July the 10th was when the statewide mask mandate went into place. So it took a while for that to take hold, but we began to see a plateauing of our caseload. This is about the time during this week was when the governor uh, recommended that schools not open until October the 28th because we felt like we had a control of the virus. We felt like with the mass mandate, we were gonna start seeing numbers go down. That was what other states had seen. Uh, so that when we got to uh, September the 28th, we would be down somewhere where we were before when we did the healthy at school uh, document. But as we all know, that did not happen because what happened was we had uh, the exacta, which was Derby weekend, and Labor Day weekend at the same time. And we are seeing, excuse me, I should put that on. Right, right. Uh, so what we are seeing is we are seeing the results of that time. Uh, this bar right here is, is uh, marked like this because this is the week we're in right now. This information came from yesterday. So the week that we uh, measure at the Department for Public Health is Monday through Sunday. So we are already almost at 4,000 cases and we still have Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we still have four more days. Now, some of these cases, if you watch the press release, have to do with a backlog of cases uh, from one of our counties, but we are still even taking those out. We are still on target have one of the highest weeks. I hope I'm wrong. I, I hope that doesn't happen, uh, but that's what it's beginning to look like. So if you have not gone to this website, please, please, please go. There is a wealth of information. Uh, and, and in fact, you have to kind of focus a little bit because we have added so many things. We've got healthy at work. We've got uh, information about schools, we've got information about nursing homes, information about daycare centers. This is where you'll see the incidence map and we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. Uh, this is where you see the sites for uh, testing uh, facilities if you want to go and have a COVID test. Uh, just a whole host of things there that I think you'll find very helpful if you if you would go to that site. What you're going to find when you go to the site, and I just took a snapshot this morning of, uh, of part of that website. The, at the beginning at the top is the big letter head Team Kentucky logo. And then right under that is the testing opportunities. And then right under that is the coronavirus monitoring. So as you see, this is as of last night. This is the number of testing we've done. This is the number of positive cases, the numbers of deaths. And right here, this is going to be important down the road is the positivity rate. We won't talk about that right now, but, but you'll, we'll go back to that. This recovered number is, is uh, woefully under-reporting. We don't have a mechanism in public health for recovered. 
uh, because uh, that's just not something that we ever measure. So the only way we can get this information is by calling people and say, are you recovered? Uh, people don't take real kindly to that. They don't like to be bothered. They've been ill and they don't feel good and they don't want another person calling them. Uh, so it's very difficult to get that number. So as you know, of those 77,000 people, more than 12,000 are recovered. But some of them are what you've heard the term, the long haulers, uh, people who have chronic fatigue, people who are still having shortness of breath months after their illness, uh, their initial illness uh, goes away. Underneath this, these green boxes, uh, you're going to find the map. And this is the map that everybody has been talking about for you to look at the color coded chart. And that's the last thing that we'll talk about. But let's talk about, whoops, to do that. Let's talk about what this map means. This is called a seven day rolling average, which means we take each county, we look at the cases that are entered into our national database from each county over the last seven days. And then we average that out um, and then divide it by 100,000 people. So it gives us a rate of what's happening in that county. Now that may differ from what's on the Facebook page because a lot of the local health departments, if they get a positive test result that day, will post it that they've had a positive test result that day. But what data we're using is these are cases that are positive. We've made sure they're not duplicates. We've made sure they fit the definition. We've made sure that we've contacted that person. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. It's done rather quickly, but don't be panicky. If you count the last seven days from your county Facebook page, uh, it may differ a bit from what's on here. It's not going to differ by a whole lot. So as in most, uh, most maps that you see, green is good, red is not good. Uh, right now, as of today, we have one green county right up here. Uh, but we have mostly red and orange. So this afternoon at five o'clock, a new map or five o'clock ish. That's why we, we tell people to look at eight o'clock at night before they make a policy decision to be sure there's been no delay with posting. But today in uh, I'll take Franklin County because that's where I live. They will drop off seven days ago, whatever that count was and add today's cases. There will be a new rate for Franklin County today. Uh, since today is Thursday, that is the day, and like I said, we'll talk about this in a little bit, that is the day that you'll be looking to see what kind of instruction should we have for the next, uh, the next physical week in our school system. Right up here, you can see something that says K-12 through Public Health Report. So I want to talk about the two different reports that you can see. There is the K-12 through Public Health Report. That is a report put together from data from the local health departments. And as I said, these are data where we have verified that we have the right person. We have verified that they live in that county. Sometimes people will work in Franklin County and get a test, but they really live in Anderson County. So we want to sort that out. We want to be sure we assign that person to the place where they live not where they go to school or not where they work unless it's a college student that's actually living living on the campus. Um, so that is the public health report. The other report that you're going to become very familiar with is this K through 12 COVID dashboard. Healthy at school, you can find that on the website right below uh, where the map was that we were just looking at. This is the data that your local school and district is reporting into the state of Kentucky. So this report here with the red arrow, this is what your school reports. And what we're asking is, do you have any new students or staff that are positive from COVID-19? And do you have any new students or staff that are under quarantine? Your school enters that. We are uh, the, the re regulation says they will be entering that on a daily basis, Monday through Friday, while school is in session. And what this will do is give you an immediate snapshot of what is happening in your school. This isn't what the principal read on the Facebook page. This isn't what Mary Lou down the street calls you up and said, I just know that these five kids are positive. That's not what the school is. Reporting. The school is to report 
when a guardian or a parent calls the school and says little Connie is positive for COVID or little Connie was exposed at a so the softball game after school and she is now positive. Those are the cases you'll report on your dashboard. Also be when the staff calls and gives you that information. Same thing with quarantine. If this child is quarantined because of an exposure at school or if this faculty or staff is, then that would be listed as a new case. That'll be and I'll show you on the next slide a snapshot of what that's going to look like. So the difference in this is this is what you report. This is immediate. This is a snapshot. This is not a scientific um, medical diagnosis that you're making. This is what's been reported to do you. This report here is the public health report that will be several days behind what you are reporting and will be the official data that will tell you what's happening in your school. So this is the self reported. So this, we're getting lots of emails from people that are confused with this and I just want to make sure you are clear. This is the self reporting. So what will happen in, in actually in, in this screen, it'll say today yesterday's date. So yesterday this fictional school reported four new students and five new staff with COVID-19 and 94 new students that were quarantined and 19 new staff that were quarantined. What this computer program then will do is tomorrow all the people in this row will be added to this row. This is the current week and all of these will be blank unless you come in tomorrow and put zeros in there and it'll have tomorrow's date. That way a public person can look at this website and say, oh, my school is keeping up to date. We've got nobody new, but in the last week we've had these many people reporting in the week, the last week. So this is giving you a 14 day snapshot of what's happening in your school. After that, at the first of next week, everything starts over. This row will move down here. These people will be added to your ever list and you'll start all over again every single day. And then here is just two different ways that that is, is grafted out. This information over here explains what I've just tried to say. This is Monday through Friday. Um, the quarantine periods, we're not going to go in there and say Connie got, got her quarantine until Thursday and Roger got his quarantine until Friday. After those two weeks are up, those people will just drop into the ever. I hope that makes sense, but there'll be plenty of time for questions afterwards. This monstrous looking report, please don't try to read this or remember it, is what that K through 12 public health report looked like as of yesterday. This report is going to be changed, so that's why I don't want you to try to memorize it. What we used was the template that we use at, at long term care facilities. That is way more information than anybody ever wants to know. This actual report that you see in front of you is not going to be reported today or tomorrow. Our staff is completely redoing this. Uh, about five and a half hours for two people every day to get this report completed. We are finding uh, we have developed a way we can do this automatically. And what will happen is there'll be different reporting. It'll just be new cases and ever cases, I believe. Um, you'll, you'll see it on Monday. You'll see the report on Monday and it will have every school district as well as every school. So uh, if you want to look at the um, poor Derrick County, they get picked on all the time because they, they're an A, but you can either look at Allen County, uh, Derrick County School District, or you can take each individual school in that district. So. This is going to look different, <coughs> Excuse me. but I think the new look will be much more helpful. So self-reported. <coughs> Excuse me, I don't have COVID. I just got something down the wrong windpipe. So self-reported and then this right self-reported here and the public health report here. OK, let's go on to the color coding. Uh, this came out the middle of September and because of feedback we've gotten from superintendents and from principals, uh, this has been modified. 
But if you go back to that incident map we were looking at, you've got green counties, you've got yellow counties. These counties have either less than one case per 100,000 or 10 or less per 100,000. These schools should continue to follow the Healthy at School flagship document. When you get into the orange, that is telling you you have a community problem. You have accelerated spread in your community. This is not a problem. Oh, I don't know how I did that. But I can fix it. Sorry, I'm going to give y'all uh, nausea. Uh, so if you are in Orange County, you alone as the health, as the school are not the people that are completely solely responsible for fixing this. This is a community issue. If there is a problem, it is a community wide problem. And this is where your, your health care system, this is where your school system, your Kiwanis Club, your uh, different organizations, the Chamber of Commerce, everybody should be getting their heads together and say, how can we stop this? Well, I did it again. I've got to take my fingers away from my screen. How can we stop this spread so that we don't get into the red over here? This is when we're recommending remote learning. So if you go by this, this color coded document, you look at the map, what the, the, the accompanying document that goes with this color coded chart, I did not put it in a slide because it's hard to read, it's so small. But it says that on Thursday night at 8 o'clock, look on that website, see what color your county is, then go to the color coded, the, the mode of instruction metrics for K through 12, and your, your local school board will make that determination. According to statute, it's the local school board's responsibility during an epidemic to make decisions about what should happen in a local school district. This will give you Friday to kind of regroup and figure out if Monday you're going to go to remote only, or maybe your color gets better and you decide to go from remote only to a hybrid model or, or whatever decision that you feel is the safest for your students, your staff and your faculty. So Thursday night, you make a decision will be made on what's going to happen Monday morning for that next school week. We looked at other states. We looked at West Virginia. We looked at Colorado. We looked at Idaho. We looked at Washington State. We looked at lots of different states, not only at their guidance, but how successful have they been with their guidance. This looks the most, if you just visually look at it, like West Virginia. West Virginia, however, only does that incident map on Saturdays. So if you are a school, you have Saturday evening, you're supposed to look at the map and determine what's going to happen Monday. We felt like that was not, clearly was not enough time for the types of decisions and planning that you would need at a local level. So that's why we put it on Thursday evenings. So I think that's my last slide and I'll, I can always go back to that, but um, I want to be able to answer questions that people have because I'm sure there would be a lot of them and that's why I'm here. So Jenny, can you take over and let me answer questions? And then I have two more things to say at the end about some that's some other public healthy kind of things I want to talk about briefly. All right, thank you so much, Dr. White. And I just invite you to open up your your microphones or use the chat feature and ask any questions that you might have for Dr. White. Can there I, were some, go ahead. It's your data. Uh, can I clarify, Dr. White, am I hearing you say that school personnel or school districts will be responsible for including the data for school in terms of new cases that may be reported per student or per staff? In the self-reported link, yes, there is a quick snapshot. What do you at a school district know about what's happening with your students right now? And that's entered by somebody in, 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 in different districts. Some districts want to do it all from the district office and some of them want the individual schools 
to submit that information, but it's submitted every day and that'll be in the self report. Yes, ma'am. And this starts Monday or is this something that it starts on this coming Monday or are we doing that it, now? It started September the 28th. Okay. And so we get calls all the time from parents saying, I don't see my school on that report. Um, if they don't see their, their school on the self report, that means that it hasn't been entered. If you don't see your school on the public health report, that means there haven't been any cases in that school or any quarantine. Uh, at the beginning, there were a lot of them, but as more people go back to school, we're gonna see fewer and fewer schools that don't have anything at all. And that's also a good, I got an email this morning from someone saying, well, I know we had four cases in August, but the report says we haven't had any. This report was required starting September the 28th. Some of the schools went back and put historic information in, but most of them just started with September the 28th. Can I ask one last question? Yes, um, but first um, I was going to say, did that answer your first question? <laughs> So because we're still in NTI and we're working on our re-entry planning to go back to school using a hybrid model um, of having in-person and virtual academy. Say a student who is in, a, in the virtual setting, are they still required to report to the school the active case of COVID if they have it so that it's included in the documentation? They are asked to report that if that child was exposed to COVID in some type of school activity. So some schools are doing virtual only, that's it. Some are doing virtual only, but with some extra activities. Some are doing sports. So if you are a virtual school, but you're still having sports and you have a student test positive or go into quarantine because they were in a sports event, you would report them. When I said I, I did lie just a little bit and I apologize because I'm just I'm old and forget stuff. So I said that there are those four numbers that you'll be reporting. There's also a checkbox asking, are you hybrid only? Or are you uh, NTI only, hybrid only or in person? That is not reported on that report, but uh, the secretary of our cabinet uses that information to send to the federal government to help us with the the PEBT card, and I'm sure y'all are all familiar with that. So he needs that information to make sure Kentucky continues to get funding for that uh, PEBT card. So that is asked on the survey every day. So if it's all zeros and you're NTI only and you just check that off, you're done. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions, I couldn't have explained it that well. Dr. White, this is Peggy Sinclair Morris from the Kentucky School for the Blind. Yes, ma'am. Um, and so, you know, we have students that come from all over the state, but we're right in the middle of Louisville. Um, is it based on the metrics on the chart? Um, if, for example, Jefferson County went into the red, um, would it be your recommendation then for us to work, work on remote instruction right now, but we're looking at having a soft opening at the end of this month with all students November 9th. But if we went into the red in Jefferson County, I mean, would it be your recommendation that we continue remote instruction? Should we that, just look at Jefferson County or should we be looking at all the different districts where kids come from? Well, that's that's an excellent question. I've not had anybody ask me that because that is way complicated and to figure that out will would take a lot of effort. Um, but I think in, in my understanding and help me, are you talking about when you say a soft opening, are these kids going to be coming and doing residential in Jefferson County? If yes. That's my understanding. Okay, yes. that's what, how I thought the system worked at, at your school. So they would be being exposed to staff uh, and people that work in, and live in Jefferson County. So that would be the recommendation because it would be very hard to keep those kids. We're, we're just not the NBA. We can't keep them in that tight of a bubble. Uh, mm -hmm. So that would be a recommendation. What happens if you say, you know what? I don't agree with you. I don't I don't think we want to do that. Uh, you would need to have some really compelling reasons as to why. Uh, mm -hmm. Because that, you know, I worry about if someone were to become infected and have a bad outcome, um, you've got 
KDE and KDPH and the governor all saying this isn't the best idea. Are there people out there that are red right now that are are still seeing patients in, uh, face to face? Yep, there are. Are there people still out there playing sports that are red, even though KHSAA says that's not what you should do? Yes, they are. But a lot of schools are telling the red counties, we don't want you to come to our county and play. And so they're actually canceling games. So um, that is a, a, a heck of a decision to make, but we feel like that that local control and you on the ground uh, with the data that you've got can make that best decision than me sitting in Frankfurt um, as a gynecologist for 20 years and now in public health for 11 and telling you how to run your school. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we have concerns about having kids here when Jefferson County is going up, up, up. So thank you. I appreciate your answer. I, I, I would not as the deputy commissioner, but just personally, I, I would agree with you that uh, that could be fraught with danger. Dr. White, this is Jennifer Hutchison from Fayette County. Can you yes. um, talk a little bit about the um, about the metric in relation to unique situations with counties who have a large university setting? Um, and and it, it's it's a very complicated matter, but I would I would love to know your opinion on um, Fayette County being red with UK and as we are trying to figure out what we're doing here. Right. Um, for for Fayette County, y'all y'all are I don't know I, I know what a trifecta is is I don't think there's a quadrifecta but y'all got a lot of fectas going on there. You've got UK, you've got Transy, you've got uh, <coughs> excuse me I don't know what got in the back of my throat today. There's the um, and I've just lost the name of it and it's the Commonwealth Bible Institute I believe that have had a lot of cases so. There are lots, there's a lot of stuff going on. I think you can though go and look at Bowling Green where they have a lot of people that work at uh, food processing plants. You can look at the counties that have jails and, uh, or have prisons that have large outbreaks. There are, lot, there are certain counties that have large outbreaks in their nursing homes. And what some of the schools have wanted to do is say, well, that's just in the prison. We're not going to count those numbers and we're going to figure out our incidence rate without including them. They are still part of the community um, and especially the colleges and universities because those kids don't stay on campus. They, a lot of them live in the community. A lot of them work in the community. So I think that for you to have a better protection of your staff and your faculty, you know, children we've talked about, children can get this illness. Children, fortunately, do not get ill, but they are spreaders. And I worry about staff and faculty being exposed to this. And then all, also the children going home and taking it to people my age, their grandparents, um, and, and what could happen there. So I just don't think there's any way we can slice and dice and cut those universities out of the equation. The more that we get the whole community wearing their masks, socially distancing, and not going out uh, when you don't have to. Uh, I mean, that that's just the message. I, I live in Frankfurt and, and we have really good compliance with those things. I travel to my hometown and surrounding counties and, I, you know, I just wanted to throttle people. But fortunately, I was raised in a Christian home and I didn't hit anybody because I'm only five foot five and I thought they might hurt me back. But, but it was very frustrating to me to see people with complete disregard for what they're doing to their fellow man. So it's the communities just have to pull together and say, we can end this. We can lower these numbers if we work together as a team. And that's really hard. Thank you, I appreciate it. Are there other questions that you have for Dr. White? The one thing that I failed to mention with the I mentioned the positivity rate and then I, I, I forgot that uh, the 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 metric instruction, the color codes that is in effect if the positivity rate in the state is below 6%. We've never gotten anywhere close to that high in Kentucky. 
Uh, it doesn't mean that if we got to 6.1% that the governor's office wouldn't say, yes, we'll still stay with the color coding. That was put in there. So if suddenly our hospital system, our healthcare system is overrun with patients and we feel like we need to go to a total shutdown, that gives that that system gives the governor's office the option to do that. But I do not foresee that happening. We would have to be in a in a pretty horrific state before that were to happen. That's why I showed you where you can find the positivity rate for the state uh, on the website, as well as the map for the incidence rate. Okay, well, if you do have further questions, definitely um, put them in the chat or email me or email Dr. White, and we'll be happy to get back with you. I, I will always respond to you. Uh, I'll, it may take a day, but I will always respond to you so, to get your information back because it's so important for me. You are the thought leaders in your community. People are looking to you, and it is so critical that that you are comfortable with with what we're talking about today, so you can translate that out to your your teachers, your staff, and and the the parents, the very worried parents. The the two commercials that I wanted to do for public health before I leave. One is we are really going to need your help with vaccination. Uh, it's going to be so important uh, to get everybody, staff and students vaccinated for flu. The last thing we want to do is to try to be confused. Does someone have COVID? Does somebody have the flu? So getting as many people vaccinated as we can. So you may be getting calls from your local health department. Can we use your parking lot for a mass flu vaccination? Something like that. We are working very hard for our plans for COVID vaccination. It's hard to make plans for a vaccine when that vaccine hasn't been chosen yet, but we are still trying to have all the pieces and parts in place so that when we find out which vaccine is going to be meet the grade and pass all the safety uh, evaluations, we can then plop that in there and start doing vaccinations as early as possible. The tier 1A people will be the healthcare workers, but uh, teachers are very high up in the tiering. So we are working to be sure that we've got our plans in place. So you'll be hearing more about that as the time comes closer. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about, and I've mentioned this before, vaping. I know that our uh, teenagers think they're 10 feet tall and bulletproof. We did when we were teenagers, they do now. Uh, and they don't think vaping is really anything bad because it's just vapor. Um, vapor to me sounds like the steam that comes off the, the kettle on the on the stove. This is not vapor. This is little droplets of oil that goes into their lungs and it damages their lungs. And a study came out in August that said that kids who do e-cigs only are five times more likely to become infected with COVID-19. If they do e-cigs and regular cigarettes, they are almost seven times more likely to be infected with COVID-19. I was very surprised when I found out that there uh, they didn't see an increase in the kids that just did regular cigarettes only because that sample size was so small they couldn't get a statistical significant change, which shows somebody my age who grew up watching people smoke cigarettes that just smoking a cigarette alone is very, very unlikely. Most people are either e-cig only or e-cig and conventional cigarettes together. So five times more likely if you do e-cigs and seven times more likely if you do e-cigs and conventional cigarettes. So when you get folks back together or maybe even on your virtual formats, start talking about vaping. Kids need to understand that it's not harmless uh, and that it can endanger their health. So. Just wanted to throw that out there, and and I know this is not shocking to anybody. This was more likely to happen in kids of social lower socioeconomic status, uh, Hispanic, multiracial, multi ethnic communities. So it's something I think we 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 can't just focus on COVID, as you know. We've got so many other health issues, and you've got so many uh, social emotional issues you're dealing with. And I I, I just I'm, I have always respected educators, but the more I deal. Uh, with KDE and learn more. I've learned an enormous amount. Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, you're making your kids and your students and your staff and their parents safe. And I greatly appreciate all the work. It's been impressive. At the last uh, 
superintendent meeting last week, we had, I think, four superintendents presented their reopening, uh, and they were just wonderful. And so this Tuesday, I don't know if you listened to the superintendent meetings, but I think we're going to have three pairs of presentations, and it's going to be either a principal superintendent paired with their local health department director and how they've worked together to try to uh, make sure that we're doing the safest things in, in our local community. So I hope that's going to be exciting on Tuesday. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you for letting me come. I, I always enjoy it. And so please email me, email Jenny. She knows how to get a hold of me uh, so we can get any questions you have. There's no, you know, there's no small question. If it doesn't make sense, ask me and we can, we can get it straightened out. Thank you so much, Dr. White, for being here and for making time in your schedule to present this information with the group and to answer questions. Thank you so much. And you're and you are welcome to share those slides. I'll, I, I sent them to you earlier, so if you want you need to share those, that that's fine. OK, thank you. We and will. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. So we are now to our last agenda item before adjournment. Let me share my screen again with you. So um, the Department of Education leadership team has asked for us to get feedback from you on how back to school is going so far. So we have a couple of guiding questions and you can unmute or type in the chat. It will be your questions will be captured either way or your information. So the first question is, how's it going for principals using participation versus so whether whatever type of model that you're on, be it virtual or hybrid, um, face to face, what's how is this going for you? So I'm seeing um, the barrier is teacher. Teachers do sometimes forget about their virtual students as far as getting that particip those participation numbers. One, one of the challenges uh, is, is as an administrator monitoring students who are not participating and because there's this sort of open ended two week period for participation, or at least in our district, uh, it makes it difficult to run a report uh, especially for a school our size, nearly 2,400 students, and identify who is not participating regularly. So our, our biggest challenge has just been trying to, to filter through uh, and identify uh, from sort of a MTSS standpoint students who um, are not engaging and provide support. Thank you, Brian. Yes, and Lester seconds that. Yeah, it's definitely. I mean, as far as the attendance goes, it's. Uh, I don't know. It's a. It's tricky. It's a tricky deal, right? Um, you know, your your virtual uh, is going pretty well, but in terms of participation, um, you know, that's a whole other um, issue, uh, separate from just taking attendance. So, um, yeah, I'll second that. Uh, just spend a great deal of time. You know, trying to track down students, guardians, parents uh, for those that aren't engaging, and unfortunately, um, the high school level that that tends to be uh, a full time job. Thank you for sharing these concerns. Any any others? Yeah, yeah. On a positive note, the flexibility is beneficial. I mean, it helps. Um, not only the schools, but it helps the kids. So uh, we do appreciate uh, the understanding of the difficulty in the situation that we're that we're in. Yes. And I see um, Jerry has also put in the chat about it's challenging for ATCs as well as meeting the needs of feeder schools. Yes, exactly. Thank you for including that, Jerry and being consistent for all students.
Jennifer notes that their lowest participation rate has been 93%. OK, so just continue. It's fine. And also on the uh, form that you'll fill out uh, like an evaluation or follow up form from today's meeting, you'll see these questions again. So if you have things that you that you didn't think of right now on the spot and you have some time for further reflection, please do include those those thoughts within that form because those are shared with the leadership team. And then the second question is what can you share about your experiences so far with hybrid remote or face to face? And we've heard we've heard some of some of this thinking already with with difficulties from engagement strategies, for example. Um, but are there some other positive and negative experiences? Share share both, please, either. There is no choice in this environment than folks coming out of their comfort zone and growing and getting better as educators. And I know I speak for Frederick Douglass High School. We had elements of uh, virtual within our regular standard operating procedures, but we've grown even more uh, because of the intensity and the amount of virtual learning that has taken place. I think it made us get better. Thank you, Lester. What other responses do you have? Or if you would like to build off what Lester has said. Um, this is Peggy. I agree with Lester. I, I know that the teachers at the School for the Blind have really had to step out of <clears throat> their comfort zone especially with technology. We rely so much on technology for our kids, um, but the teachers having to rely on using technology to teach classes, um, I, I think I think the teachers here are working harder than they've ever worked before and um, because we're all remote right now. So um, they've had to think outside of the box and I agree with Lester that I think teachers have really stretched themselves and have gotten gotten better. It's not been easy, but um, and it won't be easy continuing on, but um, <clears throat> I, th I think they've done just an excellent job. Thank you. And part of their getting better is also from your support, you know, you as their leaders um, and principals. So we, we want to commend you on that support that you're providing to your teachers at this time as well. Jenny. Yes. I'd like to say that um, I, you know, I agree with what has been said. Um, my teachers have grown. I have grown as a leader, but um, and of course, you know, I'm in Jefferson County. We have such a large, large district, and I've learned so much about my families through this experience. And I've been, I think, much more gracious and generous because when you think about families that are struggling. Um, they may have several children at home and you're thinking, well, why can't you just get on and complete your assignments? Well, there's so many other variables going on. So I have learned a lot more grace and a lot more patience um, during this time and not just with my families, but with my staff members that all and also to realize that they have things at home that they're dealing with that I wouldn't they wouldn't normally be dealing with if we were in the school building. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, Jenny, one thing I would add just from a school's perspective. Uh, first and foremost, from looking at the students uh, and, you know, um, you can't be all things to all people. And, and I see that right now for, for some of our students. Uh, they're they are absolutely thriving in this sort of new uh, virtual learning mode. They love the um, the self guidance. They they learn. They love the combination of synchronous and asynchronous work and the ability to be flexible there. Um, and they're doing really really well. Uh, and then some of our students just just feel really really lost uh, and alone. Uh, so I think it's illuminated for us as a school how how big of a role we play from a social emotional standpoint, day to day students. I think there's a lot of our students that really rely on that. And I don't know that that's always been an intentional part of our planning. It's just sort of been a byproduct of the, the, the school experience. Uh, teachers sort of the same way, you know, I think you have the continuum of those who are learning and 
are still trying to adopt these new virtual uh, strategies. And then it's also kind of illuminated um, some real rock stars and some teachers that have just stepped up and just really shined in this virtual learning. And I see them being leaders in our school in a way that maybe they haven't in the past. So that's been a really great byproduct of that. Um, thank you. Thank you. And Lester men mentioned in the chat that definitely the no internet or no technology is also a huge concern. Um, and that in it itself can affect motivation um, and providing instructional support. It's just not the same. This afternoon at 430, I'm meeting with some with some teachers online virtually, and one of the slides I'm sharing is about new teachers and and over the course of their first year of teaching and, and the dip that they experience in this time that's that's naturally occurring from October to December. There's there's a dip in how they feel about teaching and one of the one of the conversation pieces is going to be around how many teachers right now even experienced teachers feel like first year teachers because teaching it instruction does look differently now um, than it has before and they're they are learning many many new strategies um, as well so thank you all right Thank you all for sharing and again you'll have ample opportunities to share your experiences as well um, and, and definitely encourage you to do so so that these experiences can be shared with the leadership team to help them to help us at KDE recognize what it's like what it's truly like to do school right now for you and for the district surrounding you. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, Dr. Glass mentioned the Kentucky Education Feedback Survey. Um, so definitely we've already provided a link to that, but we, we will again. I think Paul is putting that in there. Yes, he is. He's Johnny on the spot. Thank you, Paul, for including that survey again. We do encourage you to take that and to share it. Share the survey with others. So voices may be heard, just as Dr. Glass um, asked. And at this time it is we are ready for adjournment. Um, we will provide a link for your feedback. The guiding questions are provided as well as ideas for what you would like to hear about at our at our second quarterly meeting that's coming up on December the 8th. So at this time for adjournment, I do need a motion for adjournment as well as a second if you would unmute. Lester Diaz motion to adjourn. Kim Rice second. All right, and um, if you don't want to adjourn or don't agree with that, you're welcome to stay on with us. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, at this time we will uh, adjourn our meeting and we just thank you so much for your participation, for your input, for your insights and look forward to seeing you again in December. Thank you to all of our presenters as well.